Somebody write a song, please, a, a decent song about Ford Cortina. I am flipping this on its head. Usually I wouldn't be very happy going into winter, but this is gonna be positive. We are gonna stay motivated, stay prepared, and, and we're gonna be ready for spring and be ready for summer. Now there's a big Ford story unfolding. And to be honest, this whole thing, way back, if I trace it right back to when I was about 15, it started when a friend of mine who'd borrowed my pen knife swapped it for a Mark II Ford Escort. Yes, he also gave 250 of his own money, <laughs> two pounds 50. We shared two of these Ford Escorts through a couple of years, 15, 16 year olds, and we had great fun rallying them around the fields. It was when the carbs would get clogged up that we'd scrape together 20 quid and we'd get this mechanic to come down. And the very first time he took the carb apart and he took this tiny little gauze filter out of the carb and it was clogged up and stuff. And he just threw it over his shoulder and put the car back together. And of course the car ran great. But as soon as he'd gone, I thought, you know what, that's supposed to be in there. And I found it, I picked it up and I cleaned it off. And I retraced what I'd seen him do, put the filter back in. And from then on, that was the beginning. That was the first little bit of work I did in the car. And it was simple as that. And I learned from that how simple cars are. So don't get put off by anything, just you can, there's so much info. Like back then you had to either know a mechanic or see one or whatever. Now there's all this YouTube and you can get stuff done. Anyway, the point is there's a big story with a Ford unfolding and I never thought I'd see a Ford again or be in a Ford again of my own, but I'm gonna not say any more about that just now. So many of you have gotten in touch in the last two weeks and there's been this theme of toys and kind of smaller fun. So here's Dave Six's son's power wheels. Now he said he found these on the curb, both of them. They both needed new batteries and one of them had serious electrical gremlins and it, he taught himself to troubleshoot electrical problems. He says his plans for the future are, are a battery gauge and LED lights and when his son gets a bit older, more power. So Dave, yeah, more power to you, keep that going. And Neil S got in touch and he said, look, I'm too young at 13 and a half to get a car yet. My dream car is a Ford Escort. Well, Neil, you see it's possible. I know you probably won't get one for a pen knife now, mate, but start saving, I'm sure you'll get there. So he's been rebuilding the transmission on his RC car instead. Mate, that is my RC car. I built that when I was 11 and I did myself a bit of damage. I was using a little circular saw to cut out the wheel arches and you'll see my hand and I think this is why I am never complacent when I'm using power tools. So let that be a lesson to you. Always wear the right gear and always keep your eye on the ball. Anyway, all that said, and talking about plastic fun, time for some esprit. And remember, if you hear the word overneath, it's a real word. You should learn it. Esprit time. Oh yeah, love those angles. Now I've got to continue to pretend that four episodes ago I didn't say that it was almost time to pull the body off this thing. There continues to be lots of little bits and pieces to come off. So we're starting with the horns. And then there's this kind of air dam underneath the radiator. And this car uses the early Series 1 type radiator which was vertical but later on the Series 2 got a development in a kind of a bigger rad that was tilted back so it could be accommodated. So around the radiator we go, and I found there was a little drain plug, so out that came, and water looks so cool in stop motion. Off came the inlet and outlet pipes, and look at these screws. Imagine the weight this thing is carrying, these can't be standard. So over to the near side, the pipe came out, the Jubilee clip was toast, and the fasteners that were holding this side of the rad, well, one of them seemed to be a bit more standard. The old case of plutonium came in very handy dropping the rad out, just don't mention that to the Libyans. There's those silly fans. And here's the rad. Now, this thing's got a bit of surface rust and stuff, but I think there's life left in it. It, it really is in good nick. I doubt it's the original, it's probably a replacement. And the only consideration here is I'm not sure it's actually capable in fine fettle of 
cooling the car adequately but it would seem like a shame and wasteful just to throw this away so I don't know later on when it comes time to put it back on if it cleans up well maybe I will it's very accessible so it's easily taken off again and we can see how we go so here's the windscreen and I stood here for a while wondering is this the time to do this it's a very big and very valuable screen when you're living on an island so I decided without a set of suction cups, which I am going to get, it was best left on the car for now. Inside the car had gotten a bit messy because for all of the space in this unit, I don't actually have a lot. And I was just putting stuff in here for safekeeping while I kept on working. So all that came out and I went for the handbrake next, which is gonna come out of this car in three stages. Now you see this plate. This plate really just holds the rubbers to seal the handbrake cable so there isn't, I suppose, noise and fumes coming in here through the bulkhead. All of the screws broke when I tried to take them out, so they're left in the bulkhead and we'll have to deal with that later. And I moved up to the bulkhead glass. All you have to do with a bonded window is to pierce the bonding at some point so you can get a wire in. And I just used a sharp off cut of steel that I found lying about. So that's what this is. And then I slipped in a wire, just another piece of wire I found knocking about and you use it like a cheese wire and cut all the way around, just slice all the way around. Now, wait until you see the bit of flex in this screen. Will George prevail against a piece of glass? Will it come out without smashing into a thousand pieces? Yeah, it was easy. The lower corner of the bonding on this screen, that's the corner nearest the camera on the left hand side. Do you see how soft this is? Do you see how tacky it still is? That shouldn't be like that. This is 20, 25 years old. It should be hard. And best practice is when you're bonding something, you obviously make sure everything is clean and free from oils and dirt and stuff. So you wipe it down with some sort of a solvent. But if you don't let the solvent dry and the sealant comes in contact with it, there's a good chance, depending on the mixture there, that the sealant will never fully go off, which is what has happened in this corner. So I popped out the surround. It was just screwed in. That was easy. And here's some trivia. The Esprit has a marine plywood bulkhead inside of a fiberglass one and some steel cross bracing. And you might say, wow, marine ply in a supercar? Okay, well, so I've read Marine ply has very, very good compressive strength. Certainly better than what you would replace it with weight for weight in some kind of a metal. So this was actually forward thinking in a sense. Safety wise, Lotus cars were winning European safety awards. They were bettering their steel counterparts in the 70s. So there was no issue there. This car is a very clever thing. And I heard Dickie Meaden on the motorsport YouTube channel in a video he's just done on the Elan 26R say a lovely line he said being a lotus it extracts brilliance from quite ordinary ingredients which I just think is a lovely quote down to the sound deadening on the bulkhead it is just really dense rubber but first I have to take these bolts out which run through the bulkhead onto brackets on the chassis so out they came and I was able to start peeling the rubber back and I found some glass behind it. So there's no question in my mind that the bulkhead glass was replaced at some point. Those bolts you see across there, by the way, they are holding the steel cross brace that's in the engine bay side of the bulkhead. Here's the glass. And the one thing about it was I, at first, it's got really unfinished edges and I thought this isn't a proper toughened piece of glass. And then I noticed there is a triplex mark on it. So it actually is the proper piece of glass. Back inside the car and finally we have a win. You know, so many things on this car have been abused or just age has really gotten to them. And you know, I wasn't getting stressed about them. There's no point, but there's more to come and I needed a win. The win on this bulkhead is that it's in such good condition. It is really, really fresh, the wood. People have pulled these cars apart before and found the bulkhead to be black rotten, absolutely destroyed with water ingress or moisture or both, or you know, just rotten, rotted away and barely in there at all. So I was very, very happy to find that this thing looks, it, the wood is still bright. It's lovely and fresh and high quality too. The only place it was a little bit dodgy is where we took that handbrake plate off and what has happened there is, and you'll see it just here, they've stopped glassing. The plate was obviously put on before these bits of glass and resin were put around the bottom. 
you see it stops in these two areas to allow for the plate. So we'll cut this little bit out. We'll probably cut the whole bit out with the two holes in it just to be sure. Bond something back in and then we'll properly bond it with some matting and put the plate back over. Up on the bulkhead, what did I find? More production line markers, 458G, the chassis number of this car, the 59th Esprit off the line. G is for the domestic market and lower and to the side, right behind the driver's back, the word silver. So if there was any doubt, not that we needed any more proof that the car was silver, this should allay it. There's two more squiggles on the passenger side. I'm not able to see exactly what they are yet. I can't imagine somebody was just doodling. So maybe I can get the adhesive off this in a sympathetic way to see what's written here. It could be interesting. Okay, into the engine bay. And I went for some bracing that's right in the side of the car. It braces the body, the C-pillar of the car, but it also braces the striker plate. So out the bolts for that came and I had to run around to the outside, pull out the bottom bolt, which is a nice big thick one. And then I could attack the striker plate. So back inside the car, out that came. And then the reinforcement bar was free. So I'm just putting everything back together the way it was. And then I realized that is not the way it was. I've put the shims in the wrong place. These shims are heavy. Look, they're just plates of steel. And obviously they built them up. It, maybe there was different amount of shims on different cars, depending on how well everything was fitting. I know obviously now this is the amount of shimming that I need. So what I'm gonna do is replace these with a piece of probably drilled aluminium. It will save quite a bit of weight across the two sides of the car. I know it's obviously a small amount of weight, but all of this stuff is gonna add up and I'm really excited to see what the sum is at the end. So that's the Esprit this time. I really hate the way it looks all kind of high up at the front like that, but hey, we're getting there. <laughs> I am not going to commit to any more forecasts about when the body is coming off this thing. Last time the Valley Pro kit went to Andy Nicholson and I want to show you his car because I didn't have a picture of it the last time so here it is. Andy it turns out is in Malaysia because when he went down there he went for a job with Lotus Engineering. Andy is a former Lotus man. He actually worked in Hethel for a short stint too. And that really makes me so happy that I've got a Lotus guy or a former Lotus guy interested in the series. Um, Andy's now a freelance designer. On that, he took my picture of the loom coming out of the Esprit, which he said inspired him. He thought it looked like modern art and he put it through a few filters. So here it is. That is just so much fun. Andy, thanks a million for that. Have fun with the GTO. Make sure you get out in it. So the next person is Jim Ramsey in Vancouver, Canada. Jim had a smart car that was given all sorts of trouble. They couldn't figure out what it was, so he packed it in. But what did he buy instead? A 1930 Ford Model A pickup and decided that he was gonna learn how to do some mechanics and stuff. But he says soup inspired him to learn how to weld. And he sent me this photo of the repairs he's done to his bulkhead. He said there were two major holes in this. He, I didn't get a photo of them. Jim, if you're gonna send me photos like this, if this is early welding for you, this is your first attempts, then just don't, don't send me photos like this. You are showing me up big time, mate. Keep it up with the project. I hope you get it done sometime soon. It looks like a lovely thing. And thanks for sending me the photos. Um, the last person is Ben Gould in the States. Ben is a young fella with a Porsche 914. And these things are expensive now. They used to be not so long ago, the car you could pick up, the Porsche you could pick up, the way you can pick up a 924 at the moment. So he's lucky to have it. He could only afford a bit of a shed. He says he reckons it's about as rusty as the Range Rover as the Vogue. Pff, oh, is it? Um, I hope not for your sake. He says he's teaching himself to use Bondo and disassemble and how not to have a major gas spill, which he did when he pulled out the tank, not realizing it was full of fuel. Well, it just so happens, man, that the next section with the Range Rover, I do pull the tank and there's a tip in there about how to siphon fuel in a really nice way, a really clean and safe way that I only learned recently enough. So I hope you like that. I'm gonna send you the kit, pal. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you keep going with the 914 and get it done soon. Anyway, here is the Range Rover. I promised you a jack last time and here it is. This is my Duff Norton ratchet jack. It's a 10 ton capacity jack, as in it will lift 10 tons and it weighs 32 kilos itself. So it really is something. I found this in a scrapyard about 15 years ago. I was leaving the place and saw it in behind some brambles 
and I asked the guy could I buy it and how much then he said he wanted 10 euros for it and I almost winced saying that because he thought I'd probably have a serious problem with that I handed him a tenner straight away and he went off happy now it was completely seized up it took me literally a day to free it all up and get it working but it is the coolest thing you know a trolley jack is almost useless with a Land Rover as are scissor jacks or anything like that you tend to have high lift jacks with off-road vehicles but they're not particularly practical in a workshop and I love this thing because it's so so solid so anyway over to the Range Rover to get these body mounts out I was able to lift the body straight away and pull out the bottom sections of the mount and then I went for the top section so there was just this one top section left because remember I cut the last one out the last time and I've left this little minor feat of manual dexterity in here because these are the nice little things that you do i find that kind of give you a sense of well-being that you've got some kind of chops even though i mean it's not like i was doing heart surgery after a couple more whacks with the lump hammer it was moving, the cross member had some more clearance but it just wasn't ready to come out yet so I grabbed the jack again and initially I put it into a stupid place underneath the body, underneath the floor so we'll just skip past this quickly and I put it back over to the side of the car where there's more bracing and lifted the body and you can see this jack just, it's just so positive, it ratchets up and it ratchets back down, it's not fast but it's so sturdy you forgive it that you see with the body lifted there is now plenty of movement in this and what did i do straight away i hit that bloody lip in exactly the same place as last time that did not happen a second time so this is a case of you know a lot of banging and wiggling and seeing <laughs> that doesn't sound right and seeing where there might be still some areas of this cross member fouling and on the near side, on the bottom of the goal post, I had missed a spot weld or two. So out with the cold chisel and I sheared through those. Now that I knew that it was free, I was pretty confident it was free. I knew it was just a case of brute force and maybe a little bit of teasing. And finally, after two or three days work, I haven't checked this actually in the log, Finally I got this out, I'd, I'd forgotten to take the little bit of wiring out of it, the wiring that goes to the number plate light in the lower tailgate, but that came out easy enough. The cross member was in terrible nick. It wasn't life-threatening you got to remember there are 10 mounts like the two that are on this across the whole body of the car these are the rearmost two yes they're important if you're carrying weight but I mean the car wasn't going to collapse underneath anybody under normal use and I'm left with a fairly sorry old state the rear ends of the floor are bad they're not terrible but there's a few little curves here and a few little lips that I'm gonna to have to remake it's gonna be fun to do that I'm looking forward to it next episode and so I let the car down and then I went to tackle the rest of that floor that I'd left. The last wells were ground out and there were these patches over at the edges I had mentioned last time. I couldn't see because they'd put under seal over them inside the car how they were done. It turns out it was just some tack wells all the way along. So I zipped those out and the floor came out handy enough. And underneath it, the story isn't terrible. The floor itself was terrible. All the edges of it were wrecked. So there was no save in this and I'm glad I took it out. And I do have one lined up by the way, so call off the hounds on that one. So I cleaned the tank a bit, I just wanted to get rid of some of the road dirt that had built up over 25 years. Cleaned it all off. The cross members are in decent nick, it seems. I won't know till I get them cleaned up a bit more. But they look good, they look solid. And these lips all the way around the floor of the car that hold in the boot floor itself. I'm gonna have to remanufacture these. I want to do it myself and I have a plan and we'll tackle that in one of the next episodes. Now, to get the tank out, I wanted to drain the fuel out of it because there was quite a bit in there. And I want to show you a little thing that I only learned recently about siphoning fuel out of a car in a clean way. That means you don't get a mouthful of fuel. 
So you put your piece of hose into the tank and you know what, you can check that the hose is submerged, that's the main thing. By blowing into it, you should hear the bubbles. The other end obviously goes into a catch tank and then if you get a smaller piece, put it into the neck of the tank and bung it with a rag or something just to bung the tank and put pressure inside the tank, as in blow into the tank, it should start the siphoning process. It will if you get enough seal and get enough pressure into the tank. And this will drain your tank if you've got the hose in nicely. So with that out, I went for the filler and both of the Jubilee clips were totally seized and I didn't want to start grinding here around all the fumes that I just released. So I got the power file and you'll know if you've ever done this that you can go easy on stainless steel and it won't create any sparks if you're careful. So the next thing was the check strap for the tank. It was pretty cruddy but I always wire brush my bolts and nuts and I always lubricate them before trying to get them out. And sometimes if it gets stiff while you're taking them out, reverse, go back screw it back in, clean it off again because it's just the grit getting caught in the threads and then it will come out easy. This seemed to be a check strap across the body of the car underneath the boot floor and it was like ribbon. It was just rotted away to almost paper. So I just cut that out. I took the wiring and the sender and return pipes off the tank and out it came. Then the cradle that holds it in came out and I went for the tow bar and on the near side, the bolt just sheared. And then on the off side, the brace bolt sheared, thankfully, because it would have taken ages to get them out. I mustn't know my own strength. And the last two bolts came out no problem. And out came the tow bar. I'm hoping not to replace this particular tow bar. I want to put a different one on, but I'll talk to you about that again. So that's your lot with the Vogue. Get ready for some fun fabrication the next time. Time for the Ford story, the main event. After the last episode, a few of you got in touch to offer me cars at distinctly mates rates, which was very touching and thank you. But the person who stood out was a guy called Rob Cullen. And it was mainly because he offered me his Mark V Ford Cortina for 750 euros, despite having paid nearly three and a half thousand euros for it only four years ago and having only clocked up 9,000 miles in that time. The car is low mileage, it is in really good nick you would not think there was 48,000 miles on the interior but it has started to rust it's a miracle it hadn't rusted more in its lifetime they were known to fall apart i could take this car and i could fix it and then i could sell it and i could sell it for two three maybe even four times what rob was willing to sell it to me for but that is not what i'm doing here that is not what this is about so what i've said to Rob and what Rob is happy to do which I'm so glad about is I'm going to take the car I'm going to fix it I'm going to drive it and when the Range Rover is done and touch wood there is no wood oh there is wood <laughs> touch wood and I can get the Range Rover under me I will give the car back to Rob because Rob does love the car and I think he's just gotten scared by the rust and doesn't want to be the person who was the end of that Ford Cortina so that's what's going to happen. I'm not going to say any more other than that Rob lives in a county that is close to my heart. I've spent so much time there surfing. It's a beautiful place in Ireland. It's directly across the country to the west from where I am on the east coast and I was only too happy to be back there. So here's Rob's story. Can I say for the record, first of all, the funds were just resting in my account. I'm Robert Cullen, I'm the editor of the Sligo Weekender newspaper. Well, I didn't start driving actually until pretty late, I was 28 years of age, but I had a kind of a love of cars from when I was much younger. Just, I have to blame my dad and this terrible driving instructor. Uh, that kind of put me off driving for a while. He owned a uh, Ford Cortina, uh, uh, I think it was a 1983 model, and I it, he still maintains it was the best car he ever owned and as a result of that I always had my eye out for, for looking for one thinking you know someday I would like to own one. Um, time came to change my daily driver, decided to get a car loan out and then decided what I would do is split the car loan in two, buy an old Ford Cortina and buy a regular daily driver as well. So um, picked uh, the Cortina I have up from a guy in County Mayo. Um, his Mother wanted it to run around for six months. She lived in America with her, sis with her daughter, his sister, and 
she was coming back for a, a few months. Uh, she wanted a car to run around. He did the uh, honourable thing of going over to England, finding a good example, bringing it back and re-registering it here. And it, once she went back to America, it had been sitting in his garage for a couple of months before I came to have a look at it. Um, again, just, I, I think nerves got to me a bit. Uh, my dad did try to teach me younger. I actually, the first car I did actually drive was his Ford Cortina, which I managed to uh, hit the front valance against the curb in the garden. That put me off for a few years. And the, just, I think, the cost, too, of trying to get motoring in this country between tax, insurance, and buying the car as well. So my uh, former editor, the man whose seat I'm occupying now, he had a Volkswagen Jetta, um, 1991, and it was a 1.6 diesel, not even a turbo diesel, top speed, 83 mile an hour downhill. And he was selling it. It had 100 and 86,000 odd miles in it. I bought it off him for less than a grand. I um, bought his car and earned his job. This is the first car I've driven without power steering and it's, it immediately put me in the mindset and the mentality that wherever I was going I was not rushing. So when I was in the Cortina um, I, I could feel the, the blood pressure falling, I could feel myself getting more relaxed. Um, you sat in the car yourself and you know how comfortable the seats are. They're, they're big old squashy uh, kind of brown velour seats and I felt relaxed and calm behind the wheel. I found actually as well there wasn't as much road rage and I do suffer from road rage but there wasn't as much behind the wheel at the Cortina. I found that people were more courteous to me as well. Um, it does take a while to get over the fact that everybody is staring at you, uh, you know, at, at you driving past, but they're looking at the car that couldn't give a damn who's behind the wheel. The car was uh, an English car, so it had a, a, a higher spec than the Irish cars had. Um, this is a kind of a, a popular belief at the time that the English cars were loaded with goodies and the Irish cars were stripped of them. Um, but there is some truth in that. Um, it's a 1981 1.6 GL. So again, being a GL, it has stuff like the, the uh, headrests. Uh, it, I think it had an extra, uh, or a, a, a special um, sound system fitted, an optional extra sound system. Um, it had a dealer fit sunroof, uh, which was just the, the kind of tinted Perspex, as opposed to um, a factory fit sunroof, which I don't think was available in the Cartina, it would have been in the Granada. Um, the history is, is pretty meticulous from the second owner on. Obviously these cars new were bought by reps, they were bought by companies, or they were bought by family men. Um, so they were just a practical car. Nobody was buying them thinking that they're going to be a classic. Um, the second owner, when he took it over with 20,000 miles in it um, in 1983, he um, took meticulous notes on, every time he went for petrol, he took notes on uh, how many miles were on the clock at that stage, um, how much in litres and in gallons he got of petrol and how much that cost. And he also took notes on the amount of money he spent on servicing and things like that. There's a little brown hardback notebook full of details like that. All the old MOT certificates are there as well, proving the mileage is, is genuine. It has uh, 48,000 miles there now. It had 39,000 when I bought it four years ago. and. When I bought it, I was amazed at just the condition of the interior. Um, I don't think the back seats had been used. I, I, even the back doors were kind of stiff. I don't know if they'd been opened that often. Um, it, was, it was an immaculate car when I bought it. Um, maybe it's suffered a little bit since then, but obviously the second owner took really good care of it and cherished it. And I think maybe that's a very British thing that these guys, you know, Sunday is their day for washing and polishing their car and they take meticulous notes and a bit, uh, I suppose we call it a bit anal, a bit OCD about it, but it, it's to the benefit of the car the way it stands now, definitely. I've, I've seen myself more, of, more as a, a custodian of the car than an owner. I did have a, a mild panic attack about two years ago when the first little bits of rust started appearing and I was like, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? Uh, nobody's going to want this car. And then I thought to myself, well, no, I want this car and I'm going to drive it for another few years. Um, but especially after the summer we've just had, I just haven't been able to take her out as often. And 
while I do have a place, hopefully, that I can put it away for the winter, you know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. If I leave it there for the winter, it's just going to sit there and then I'll have the same problems next year. Um, so I think I need to, I would like to pass it on to somebody who I know is going to use it and give it the kind of general maintenance that it needs to keep it going. But yeah, primarily use it, primarily get it out on the road, get it driving. Because like any car, if you leave it sitting, it's not happy. I think I've, I have pangs of guilt about seeing Kurt, uh, Tina, as I call her, seeing her every time I walk out the front door of the house under a rain cover. I just, I want somebody to use it. I think that's basically it. I want someone to use it. When it's used in ads, um, it, it's, you're probably right to be skeptical. It's, it's up there as a cliche really at this stage, but I haven't placed an ad for Tina. And if I did, I wouldn't use that. I'd, I'd be brutally honest about the car, which I think I have been to you. Um, that it, you know, there are bits of rust in it, um, but it's, it's still a usable vehicle. It's still a usable car. I still drive it. Um, and I, yeah, again, it comes back to the phrase, I do want it to be used. I want somebody who is perhaps more mechanically minded than me to take care of it, would have a bit more mechanical sympathy with it. And we'll just rack up the miles. It's done 48,000 miles, which Seems almost a shame for a car that's as usable, still everyday usable, as the Cortina is. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I, I to, to own the car was a bit of a dream, not a flight of fancy dream, it was a kind of a, oh, someday I would, and then I stumped up and I paid the money and I got the car. Uh, I couldn't have imagined it'd have the kind of effect it has had on me and I've enjoyed it for what it was and that effect. I feel very conscious too of the fact that we are in a horrible climate in this country and especially, as I said, the last summer just gone hasn't been kind at all to anyone with classic cars. And uh, I've been to two or three shows this year and I think it's rained at every single one of them I've been to. Uh, I, I remember one which is only just down the road from where I live. Um, we had sunshine, rain and hailstones in the space of an hour and a half. And when the hailstones came, everybody either jumped back into the car or ran into the nearest tent and nobody was looking at anything. So that's what you've got to put up with in this country, I suppose. Um, Sligo, in particular, is a beautiful place uh, with mountains. And if you drive and if you enjoy driving, the entire west coast of Ireland, the, the, as they call it, the, um, the Wild Atlantic Way is fabulous. Um, we have a particular nice drive that I've done in Tina maybe seven or eight times now at this stage called the Glenef Horseshoe. It's the far side of Ben Baldwin, which is the most recognisable mountain in Sligo. And it climbs up and it goes around, twists and turns, very picturesque, very scenic. Um, if you go up there in bad weather, you'll hit fog. But if you go up there on a nice clear day, it's, it's amazing and you get some amazing views. I do like actually doing that drive in Tina. Um, uh, just just to see the views and I have taken some photographs of her when she's been up there as well Just a wish maybe that, that somebody else will get to actually enjoy the things that I've enjoyed from owning and from driving Tina oh God I did sing one with the shanty group once I'm trying to remember what it is uh, Tina Turner song with a shanty group. Yeah, Proud Mary. <laughs> shanty group. See, we were called we were called the mutineers because we mutiny against traditional shanty songs. So we take pop songs, anything to do with the sea or water, and connect it. And of course, Proud Mary, big wheels keep on turning. Rolling, rolling, rolling down the river. This thing with the Cortina, it scares me. It's, I think it's a really nice thing and I feel good having decided to do this, but it scares the hell out of me. So hopefully I can pick that up for the next episode. If not, it'll be the one after that. But I hope that's interesting and I'm really glad that Rob got in touch. Now, this episode has been packed full of people and I just wanted to say that it was tough. And I'm gonna have to try and start 
cherry picking the stuff that really helps us all stay motivated in the future. But please keep getting in touch because even behind the scenes, it does me the power of good. It keeps me motivated and it, you know, when times are, are kind of tough in the middle two weeks between episodes and maybe I lose a few subscribers or something and I'm pulling my hair out, it's the comments and it's, the, it's you getting in touch that keeps me going. So please keep doing that. There are two more people I have to mention. One is Sam Taylor. Sam got in touch and he wants to send me Etch Primer, which I just think is the really the nicest thing. And thank you, Sam. We'll talk about that. I think it's crazy to send, you know, stuff from overseas. If you're in Ireland, then maybe. But anyway, what Sam did do is he got the books. Sam is getting the JPSG lay. Someone got the books. And the whole point was, I wanted to talk to you about the books. So the first one is My Autobiography by Guy Martin. And we know this guy. And if you don't know this guy, you should know him. He's a TV personality now, but he's a big road racer. Um, he's in Ireland a lot, I think, or, or used to be in Ireland a lot. But he is just one of us, a hard-working, ordinary, honest guy who loves motors. And I thought that was a really interesting book. The second one is And the Revs Keep Rising by Mel Nichols. And this, without doubt, every car guy should have this on the shelf. I'm just that simple, get this book. Whether you like or loathe Jeremy Clarkson, he is a very, very good, a very clever and funny journalist and insightful. And he has cited Mel Nichols, this guy, as probably inspiration number one. And he's gone as far as to say that the stories in this book, the stories that Nichols wrote in the 70s and 80s, he, Clarkson has tried to use that inspiration, use them for inspiration, tried to make them in TV form. And when you read this book and you watch Top Gear, some of the better episodes, the kind of big road trip ones, you realize that he's not joking. This is a fantastic collection of stories and you should try it. You should try it out. You should really read this book. Rob had this on the shelf when I went to interview him, by the way. And Rob's a journal. Speaking of journals, Russell Bulgan. This is the very best of Russell Bulgan, and I'm very lucky to have a copy. It took me a while to get this. I actually got this from another UK-based journal, Carlton Boyce, who's been really supportive. Thank you, Carlton. Russell Bulgan sadly died in 2002, but he is a seminal motoring journalist. He has written incredible stories, very creative, a very creative writer, and he inspired so many people. And his dying wish was that something be done in aid of cancer research. So his peers got together, collected his stories and, pr and produced this book. And that's kind of why it was in limited numbers and that's why it's uh, tough to get. So there are the three books. Sam, well done, mate. The Gilet is coming to you. And Sam has a 73 Celica, amongst other things, and has a fantastic thread about it on Retro Rides. So I'm gonna link to that in the description. And I know that I've gotten some support from Retro Rides. So guys, thank you as well. Last guy, Ollie Proctor. He is the younger and, so he says, better looking brother of Harry Proctor, who was in episode seven with his Defender and his MG and got the Valet Pro kit. And Ollie was trying to twist my arm to send him a Valet Pro kit because they've got a bit of sibling rivalry going on. And I didn't think that was fair to everybody sending two to one family. But Ollie kind of got under my skin because of two things. First, he, he got glandular fever, right? That's kind of by the by, but it knocked him for six. And when he was recovering after two months, he decided the best thing to do was to get a classic car and start working on it. Awesome. So he got an MG. No, he got a Triumph, a 65 Spitfire, and very pretty it is too. And instead of getting a kind of a beater straight off, he got something that was drivable, notched up 1200 miles over the summer. And he and his mate, Will, made this really cool little video and I can't use the music to it, so I'm gonna link to it in the description because it's worth a watch. That was the first thing. But then I asked Ali, are you gonna work on this car now over the winter? And he sent me these photographs. He's already gotten stuck in. And here's the point, winter is coming. You can see that as an excuse, or you can see it as an opportunity to be set up for an epic spring, an epic summer, like Ali is doing. And cold as a state of mind, or damp, or lack of space, or no garage, get stuck in, do it outside if you have to, you will get it done. Ali, I had to applaud the video and I had to reward what you're doing. So do not rub this in Harry's face too much. 
but this is what I've done. This is prototype number one. Don't stall, mate, keep going. And yeah, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't trying to gauge interest in this as well. If anyone is interested in these, I would love to produce them. Maybe I can stop leaning on my patrons so much. I hope you like it, mate. Speaking of patrons, Alex King, sorry, Ant King, Alex Rock, Dan Brinks, Dave Six, Greg Menunos, Jose Salvado, Carolis Stadalenkas, uh, Mark Holtum, Michael Burke, Michael Buckley, Phil Wildcroft, Tom Hodson, and who we've just met, Rob Cullen. Guys, I'm trying to keep myself motivated. I'm trying to keep you motivated. So thank you. You are helping me with that. I'm trying to advance my life and I really want to pay it forward too. So stick with me and you're making a massive difference. Thank you. The link to Patreon is in the description. I do post stuff there. That's the one place I get to post stuff. And I really feel it's important to post stuff there because of the people who are there helping me out. Okay, this has been a long one. I'm sorry, I will tighten it up next time and we'll be back on form. In the meantime, get stuck in for winter, get yourself organized. And remember, if you do not make the time, this is what you will get. Good luck.